Hey, everybody, this is Stacey Rossetti. Thank you so much for hanging out with us again. This is the Badass Women Investor Podcast, and we are going to be interviewing another badass lady out there who's investing in all kinds of sorts of things. So we're going to get into that. Thank you so much, Melissa, for hanging out with us today. Introduce yourself. Well, thanks for having me on. This Mm -hmm. is going to be good. Um, I'm Melissa Johnson. I am based out of San Antonio, Texas. I have been uh, flipping houses since 2003. So I've been 18 years in the business. Um, got five kids. Um, so that's always a challenge and fun, but, but it's good. It's good. That's, that's kind of me in a nutshell. (laughs) So 18 years, five kids and like how many deals? I think we are at close to a thousand transactions at this point. That is crazy talk. Yeah. How are you, how how do you not have all your hair turning gray and and pulled out yet? Uh, There's a lot of gray in there. It's just, it's it's lurking. (laughs) I haven't gotten to the point yet where you have to try to hide it. You know, I'm, I'm tired of trying to hide it at this point. (laughs) I know. It's like, yeah, it's COVID. Yeah, it's fine. (laughs) Awesome. Cool. Well, tell us a little bit about how you got started and then really let's focus on maybe the last couple of years, what you've been focusing on as well too, what kind of deals and stuff, because the market changes, of course, especially in 18 years. So oh yeah, how did you get started? I feel like we've been through it all. I know. Um, so got started, um, like I said, back in 2003, um, my husband at the time, uh, his father-in-law was flipping houses and he had started out as a contractor and then working for an investor And then he got into investing and, you know, that was something that wasn't even on my radar. I worked for a government contractor. So I had a, um, like an office job, a cubicle job. Um, It was a good job and it wasn't exciting. It was really nowhere to go. Um, So it was kind of, I just felt kind of stuck. So when we started talking about what his dad was doing, we thought, maybe we should try this, you know? So he made it look so easy too, you know, right. It, it seems so easy when you get started and it's really not, but, um, but yeah, that's pretty much how we got started. Um, started out doing a lot of rehabbing and creating owner finance notes and then packaging those and selling them. I love that. Yeah. How did you so, even figure that out? Well, luckily, so um, we had a mentor And so the guy that my father-in-law was working for had mentored him. And so then he took us on also, and it was a great relationship at that time because we were still working full-time and we started flipping part-time on the side, but we had this mentor who was also a private money lender for us. So it was a win-win, you know, we didn't have to worry about where the money, you know, going out and getting money or loans or hard money, anything like that. It was readily available. And then we really did all the legwork, self-educating ourselves and, doing all of our own marketing and things like that. He was really just there as kind of a guide. If we ran into some situation that we didn't really know how to handle just because we weren't experienced enough yet. But for the most part, we really just took, took it into our own hands to, to learn everything about the business that we could. So basically from 2003 to 2006, what was the market like versus like 2006 to 2009? The market rocked. Yeah, so 2003 to 2006 was awesome. It was so good. In fact, I was talking to my realtor yesterday and I said, dang, this like, this reminds me of the old days of doing deals where they just fly, you know, they're just flying off the shelves. Um, It was really a lot. Basically how it was like from 2010 to maybe 2015. Yeah. Like the early years were great. It was really good. Yeah. The early years were great. Stuff would move. It was, it was easy. And then of course, 2008 came along and it was really difficult. And so luckily during that time period, because we, we already had the experience creating notes and doing owner financing, that actually is what pushed us through that difficult time because it was really the only way to move properties. Nobody was doing bank loans at that time. It was, it was finding those buyers was really difficult, but finding people who still needed to buy a house, but their credit wasn't as good. Um, you know, they still needed a place that we still need to move the property. So we had that exit strategy nailed down. So we were able to actually during that period, really build the portfolio of owner finance notes and having some rental properties. And then as the market got better and better shifted back into rehabbing 
And then I think around 2015 was when we really started hitting wholesaling hard. You know, we had done one-off ones throughout the years, but I actually built that as a whole piece of the business during that time. And so we pivoted more to wholesaling, less of flipping. And now with the market, the way it is with, you know, low inventory and everything, I feel like now's a great time to flip. So we're flipping again. So just shifting, you know, as the market shifts and knowing what exit strategy to deploy, depending on what's going on in the market, it's really important. Well, I think flipping now, essentially you're saying flipping now because, um, because people are just buying at like such higher numbers than like on the back end. So you just, you know, because like, I think like they're selling at higher numbers and just buying at higher numbers. Are you still finding like a huge spread on your deals for the flips? Yes. Okay. Yes. When you can get them. So the buying is more difficult right now, but the selling is, is just fantastic. Yeah. Well, Texas is crazy. It is crazy. And the, the inventory is so low right now, you know, I just put a house on the market on Tuesday and we had like 30 something showings and, you know, multiple offers above asking. I mean, it was just, I mean, we always have that situation anyway, but this is like crazy stuff above asking. Well, cause we're looking, we're thinking about moving back to Austin and um, cause I'm originally from Austin. Oh, okay. That. And uh, so we're like, okay, well, maybe, but then I started looking at the houses. It's like $250 a square foot plus. It's like crazy for house purchases over there. So it's oh, like, Austin's why, bad. Yeah. Why would you pay 250 a square foot for a house when you could build for half that? Exactly. That's one thing that I don't understand people are doing, honestly. You know, it, it, some of it is just the areas and, and stuff too. Like I know in Austin, there's so much gentrification going on. And even in San Antonio, there's quite a bit of that too. You know, I, I drove um, the east side, the near east side of downtown in San Antonio the other day. And it is just shocking to me. Like they, they've been trying to revitalize that area for a while. Um, but you can drive that whole area and literally there will be a house like falling in on itself and then a new construction right next to that. And then like a crappy rental house with like 20 people on the front porch and dogs running around all over the place, you know, and then two houses down, you got another new build. So it's just, it's just crazy. And I, I just like, how do you comp that? You That's, know, how just all over the place. That's how Atlanta is too, as well, actually. It's just like one house after another, or it's either blocked. It's like one block to the other, like one block will be just horrible. And the next block will be just like brand new, new construction, modern homes. And that's why this is so crazy to me because it's not even, you can't even drive a whole block, which is nuts. It's like every street is different there. You can't go down any one street and find everything's all fixed up. That's it crazy. is literally just a hodgepodge of, you know, new construction renovated homes because it's older homes so the early like 1900s so they're renovating those and keeping the character or else they're tearing them down and they're doing these super modern new construction builds exactly. so it's a mixture of all those things together and then vacant yeah. lots everywhere yeah 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 that's exactly how it is here in atlanta too it's really crazy so tell me are you do you think you're going to get back into notes because i feel like creative deal structuring is going to be what's going to what's going to make or break a lot of people over the next couple of years what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I agree. For me right now, the buying, because the buying, the inventory is just the prices, like what I want to pay for something I create a note with, it's just not available right now. Yeah. So I feel like as soon as things start shifting, yeah, um, that's going to be the time. Cheaper to, is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I am, I have very specific criteria on what I do want to keep long-term for a note and for a rental property. So it's got to fit into that. Yeah. Yeah. So with the rehabs, then you said you had a doozy. What was this doozy that you were talking about? What's going oh, on? <laughs> it was so great. It's just one of those, like, this is the best deal ever <laughs> kind of a situation. Um, Tell me about it. Yeah. So um, it was a referral, which is great. And I, that's something I've been coaching my clients a lot on lately is just really like getting after those referrals because that's such a low cost, uh, lead cost, deal cost. So I literally paid this lady like 500 bucks that gave me the referral. You can't beat that for lead cost. Was it like a, like a, like a bird dog or like, was it like yeah, a referral so than like somebody that you knew? This lady, she's actually, um, she has sent us three properties now um, that she just, she's just, I guess she's really good at networking and, and she's a big church goer and stuff. And so she talks to a lot of people and, um, 
yeah, she sent us like three places already that we've bought and made good money on. And it's just people that are in situations. They just need to, a lot of it's elderly people that we've been buying that she's been referring to us Mm -hmm. and they just are looking to downsize or move closer to, you know, their kids, family, whatever. So anyway, um, we get this deal. It's a referral. Um, we bought it back in November and we did a lease back for her because she was having a house built. And so when we bought it, we bought it for 95. I budgeted 25. Um, the house, once they moved out, it was kind of hard to see because they had a lot of stuff in the house, but once they got everything out, I'm like, this isn't that bad at all. Actually, a lot of this is salvageable. And I'm really big when I rehab on what can I save? How can Mm -hmm. I, not cut corners, but like these cabinets are perfectly fine. We'll just paint them. We'll put new hardware on it. You know, there's no reason to rip everything out. Especially now when people are so desperate for houses. Yeah. And so I'm like, how can we quickly get this thing on the market? Cause it was a quick turn kind of a thing. So anyway, we came in under budget. I think we came in around 15 or so 15 That's to crazy. 17 That's all crazy. in. Awesome. Well, wait, what did you purchase it for? 95. Okay. So 95 plus 15. Okay. Yeah. And I had borrowed 120 because I had borrowed for the purchase in the rehab. Okay. And so at the time when we um, were doing the deal analysis, we had comped it at like 215 for the ARV. Mm-hmm. And what part of our process is to always reevaluate and recomp right before we go on the market because, you know, things change and depending on how long you've held something, we held that one a little longer than we normally would just because we had the freeze here and we had some building material shortages going on and the lease back took longer than we anticipated. So we held it for a little bit longer, but um, in the end, when we recomped it before we put it on the market, uh, there was a property that had sold for like 250 in the area, same house, same floor plan, everything. So we went on the market. Um, My strategy is to always um, go under, you know, what I think that it'll go for Mm -hmm. because we can always go up. And I knew that it would get bid up already anyway. Yeah. And I don't ever want to run into an appraisal situation where something's not going to appraise. Like you could bid it up all you want, but if it doesn't appraise for that, it's worth it. Especially nowadays. Yeah. And so um, we looked at everything again. I said, well, let's go in at 237.5. And so we did. And then we ended up getting an all cash offer for like 242.5. No, they at no repairs, no inspections, no survey. They're paying title. Um, They didn't. The only thing I have to pay is the HOA transfer docs. That's it. I'm like, I'd be stupid not to take this deal. And they're, they're closing, uh, in a week, a week and a couple of days. Can you run title that fast in Texas? Um, I will be pushing that. (laughs) Cause it takes like for, uh, it takes like 30 days at least now. I mean, it's ridiculous in Atlanta. Oh gosh. No, it never takes that long here. You can't close less than like 60 days in Atlanta. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's really, if I push hard enough, but I do, I have a long history with, the people that I do my closings with, I close at um, an attorney's office. I was closing at a title company, but they don't want to close land trusts anymore. And that's how I buy properties. So yeah, that's how we do I had to shift that strategy back to the attorneys and it's fine. It all goes through a title company anyway, but just pay them a little bit extra to do it. Yeah. And they'll push it through. And, and yeah. we actually bought the property from them too. So they know the title's clear anyways. Yeah. 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 I, I don't see we buy everything problem. in land trust as well too. And it does, it gets complicated. I totally get that. People don't want to figure it out. Mm-hmm. That's the whole purpose of the land trust. Exactly. <laughs> well, what happened in our situation is um, we were closing at a, at a title company and I have like, since day one, I bought properties in land trust. That's just how we buy them. And okay. suddenly they changed their underwriting rules or something. And they said, well, we don't, we can close these, but you have to put on the deed who the, um, I think it's the beneficiary they want it on there. And I'm like, why am I going to put that on there? That's, that just strips away the whole, that's the whole purpose. purpose. Yeah. The trust. You don't want people to know. <laughs> exactly. It's like, I'm not putting anything. I'm not putting a name on there. I'm not putting another company name on there. Like I'm not going to do that in a filed recorded document. The right person needs to close that deal. Right. Right. That's somebody that actually truly understands how it works, you know, and it's good that you use an attorney because essentially what happens is if something does happen, you could just be like, Hey, refer to my attorney, please. Yeah. 
And it's never been an issue. The yeah. only reason it became an issue, it was the title company. It was their, their underwriting policy that they decided that they didn't want to do that anymore. So I, I said, well, if you're not going to change, then I'm going to have to just move my business somewhere else. So I did. That's what happened with me. So I told like, I, we decided, so what happened is my, uh, my accountant was like, Stacy, you can't, you can't be buying all these properties up in like a company. You just can't, like I had a lot, like 30 properties in one company at the beginning. Oh. I had no idea what I was doing. Right. He was like, you can't put this many properties into, he, I had, I had hired him. I had a different account that had never told me this. And in my, my new account that only works with investors basically said like, you need to start protecting yourself. Like if you're going to have this many properties, you need to start protecting. He's like, you have to learn how to either start you know companies or do land trust or something. So I started looking into it. We started educating ourselves. And then I basically went to my attorney because in Georgia, we close it. We close with attorney. So I went to my attorney, which is very traditional attorney and said, you know, I got to start closing in land trust. This is what my, my accountant's telling us. So, you know, you're going to have to start helping me do this. And they were like, we've never really closed in land trust before. And I was like, you've got to figure figure this out. Otherwise I'm going to go to an attorney that understands this concept. And guess what happened within the next couple of weeks, they were like, we got this down. <laughs> we started creating all these land trusts for us and figuring it all out and stuff. And we used them for many, many years. And then we switched over to like a, like, like a, like a better attorney that understands it. But, but yeah, I, I, I love land trusts because they really do create a lot of privacy and they make things kind of complicated, which is kind of nice, especially especially you because you understand this because we have a lot of properties. Oh yeah. So if you can put it in a land, I love that you use those too. I rarely run across people who buy properties in a land trust anymore. So that's, I like that. But it's, you know, it's a good strategy, I think, to use. You use the land trust and then, you know, spread your assets out over different companies too, not have all your eggs in one basket. Exactly. Yeah. So our accountant tells us like a million, a one up to a million dollars in one company. Yeah. That makes sense. That's, is what they tell us. And once you hit a million dollars, then go out and get another company and then buy all those properties in, in each and separate land trusts. Yeah. One thing I started doing too, is I created a separate company that just for the long-term holds too. So yeah. even keeping that separated from uh, the regular flipping stuff. I think helps too. Yeah. Yeah. We do. We do. We do that. We do that too, as well, too. We have some, I have so many companies. I can't even keep up. My husband handles all that for us now. Luckily he has this kind of brain and he's the, he does the structuring, a, a structuring of our estate essentially is that way. He, that's what he does. And uh, which is, you know, which is awesome. Like when you get to a point where like we're structuring our estate right now, <laughs> this so good, you know? <laughs> yeah. You feel like a real badass, right? <laughs> You're a badass when you're talking about structuring and land trust and stuff like that. Yeah, my estate. <laughs> my estate exactly. So cool. Awesome. Okay. So you're doing now you're flipping. Uh why did you why did you implement wholesaling? It was just a good time for it. You mean are you talking about like maybe like 2013 to 17? Or when were you doing that? Just out um, of curiosity. I feel like it was it was it really started around 2014 or 15. Mm -hmm. yeah. we, and like I said, we did, we did them before. It just wasn't a big part of our strategy. We were mostly flippers at yeah. that point, rehabbers. Yeah. Um, but then we were noticing, you know, what people were willing to pay for these houses. Well, and they're doing that now too, right? Or is it harder? I think I'm not sure. It's just harder to get deals. Even, you know, we're on all these buyers lists and stuff, you know, for all these wholesalers and everything. And everything I see is just crap. Like none of it's a good deal. So I think people you just go directly to the owners. Exactly. And that's what we've always done. So I I've never bought a property from a wholesaler. I don't think probably ever. Yeah, I have, I haven't bought a lot of properties from wholesalers, but I did just have yesterday. I had a wholesaler send me a storage facility and it's actually a really good deal. So I just sent over a contract and that's probably the first time I've done that in many, because they just, sometimes they fudge it, you know, commercial is a lot easier though. Commercial, cause you have to, you have to offer like an OM and a PPM and like, you know, all kinds of stuff and you got to run numbers. And so it's a little bit different, but yeah, on the residential side, it's hard to find good wholesalers. What they do is put it under contract and then text you the address and say, do your own due diligence. Oh, uh, see, we that's don't do it. We don't operate that way. We have a very... And, and I think that's why this was such a good strategy for us too, because I love systems and processes and wholesaling is a great place to implement something like that. It's so, once you get that system down, it's so easy to do. Yes. And it's really just, you know, by building your buyer's list, knowing your buyer's list, you know, knowing who buys what, where, what they're willing to pay, you know, do they close? What kind of 
money? Are, are they using hard money, private money? Are they reselling it to somebody else? You know, like we sell stuff to new Western all the time and Oh yeah, that's good. And, but then they're wholesaling too, you know? So it's like, I, I don't know who's buying these end properties, but they're overpaying. Like I'm somebody sure. that's willing to pay more than you is who whole, is who New Western is wholesaling them to. Exactly. Like, you wholesale it and they'll be like, oh yeah, we'll just mark that up like 10 grand and take five of it, you know? That's what New Western does. Yeah. Well, I mean, not a bad thing, you know, but like sometimes. No, I mean, that's their model. That's just how their model is. Yeah, that's their model. Yeah. I'm not um, interested in doing a $5,000 deal though. <laughs> some people are. I mean, actually new Western, usually they only, they only make like five grand on each deal. I know. And they that's just shocking to me. They do yeah. like a lot of deals every single month. So, I mean, their volume. Yeah. See, and I'm the other way. I could care less about volume. I'm more concerned about spread. Yeah. I want to do better deals and less, less deals that are better work harder, not work smarter, not harder. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and then as I think as the market, you know, starts crashing and stuff, essentially, it's going to be it's really only going to be about how can you solve that person's problem? Mm -hmm. All right, that's really what it's going to think it's going to come to is like how like this person, like a lot of people are just going to come through and be like, you know, I'm going into foreclosure, I'm going bankruptcy, you know, whatever it is. Okay, well, how can I solve your problem? And then I think that's gonna be a big deal. That's a big thing. Yeah, for sure. Well, and I see that coming to now that they've opened up foreclosures and evictions again. My feeling is that around August or so is when we'll really start to see, but I feel like, you know, with everything that happened last year, we're really just seeing the effects of all that now. And so that's been interesting to kind of watch and track too. What's happening in Texas in terms of like, you know, the eviction. So now they're open, like our tenants, you know, are you seeing a lot of like issues with tenants not being able to pay, getting kicked out or like even people going into foreclosure? Do you guys see that a lot? I mean, I, I, I see like the government, I think that I think they're like their help ends in September or something. Right. So like yeah. you said, August, September, you're going to start seeing like a lot of stuff happening. What's it like in Texas? Yeah. Well, here, I think it's been by county because okay. um, so where I'm at in Bear County, which is where San Antonio is. Um, the mayor and the judge have been holding on to that moratorium. So they are the ones that said, you can't do anything. Nothing's going to happen. It's been really frustrating because the surrounding counties and other areas in Texas have been able to do it. So I think it's my, it must be on a county by county thing is what my, it sounds like from my attorney, because she said, yeah, we've been doing evictions and foreclosures in the surrounding counties, but we can't do anything in Bear County yet. Mm -hmm. And they just this month did the first uh, foreclosure auction. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. yeah. At the that? beginning of this month. And so like, it's been like over a year. <laughs> that's crazy. As I said, it's all going to start. Like I said, by the end of this year, I think things are going to be a lot. The things going to be changed. So um, what do you think? Are you still going to be doing, you're going to be doing rehabs as long as you know, on the back end, you have a good spread or are you mm -hmm. going to be like, yeah, you can do and yeah. what, what size rehab do you usually do? Is it like the, you said 15,000 is like a typical one or you do bigger ones as well? I do bigger ones too, but um, over the years, just because I've done it for so long, I'm kind of burned out on big, huge projects. So I really just cherry pick the rehabs. Like this one was a no brainer. You know, I probably could have wholesaled it and made like 30, 40, probably, probably 40, maybe something like that. And I'm like, that's stupid. I can spend 15 or 20 rehab it. And we're, we're looking at about a hundred thousand dollars. We're going to be netting at the closing next week. So that's the way it's done. Yeah. That was a smart move. <laughs> yeah. I love those good ones. And Me you know, and I love the ones where you get like a lot of people bidding up. now, of course it's normal, but when like they start bidding up on them, you're like, yeah, this is a good one. <laughs> yeah. I knew when my phone was blowing up with showings, I'm like, okay, we're, we're fine. Are you a realtor too? So you do sell them or how does that No, work? No, I'm not a realtor, but my realtor loops me in with the showing stuff. So okay, I get cool. all the notification. I just, I like to know who's coming in and out of the property. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. So, and then, so with San Antonio, you can find property for 215 grand or two. Oh, like, yeah. yeah. Okay. So because it mean like this, you can't find that in Austin. Oh no, not in Austin. Yeah. Austin's like 300 plus now. Yeah. yeah. Well, in San Antonio, again, my realtor and I were talking yesterday just about how crazy all this stuff has been and, and how, we're just like so far over asking and the values too increase so much. And we were talking about the fact that 
the median home price here has even increased. So it's even a shift in thinking like for me and her, cause she's been a realtor for God, 30 something years. And I've been doing this for almost 20 years. And so you kind of get stuck if you've been doing it for a long time and you're thinking, I'm not going to pay that. And I remember like us recently too, looking at a house, it's like, ah, I bought a house on the same street for $40,000 before. Like, why is it $140,000 now? This is like the ghetto. <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> it's not a good, the house is falling down and it's, their values are just outrageous. And so we were talking about it and it's like, we're making that mind shift of the median home price being, you know, 150 to 175 here. And now we're looking more like, like 250, 220, 220 to 250, the median home price. So it, it creates a, a shift in your mind too, of having to rethink what the values are, especially when you're, you know, calculating like offers. Mm-hmm. And then you think like, what's happening to all these people that live in houses that are like 50 to a hundred thousand dollars. They're just getting kicked out, man. Yeah. Yeah, we're having, we're going to have a serious, I think, uh, especially in Texas, I mean, in, in the big cities, but a serious affordable housing issue. I don't know. Do I agree. That? Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. And I was actually thinking about that the other day, because I've been thinking about getting into new construction and the fact that we need more affordable housing here. Can you get like, I mean, can you get cheaper price, like a uh, price per square foot to build in San Antonio, Texas? I mean, in Austin, we've been looking like my, my, uh, my uh, stepfather is a contractor and I talked to him as like, he said he could do like, he, like 120 to 150 per square foot to build in the Austin area. And I said, okay, that's like what Atlanta is essentially. Is it kind of the same in in San Antonio or is it cheaper in San Antonio? Honestly, I don't know because I just started going down this road, but I feel like that's a pretty good number. Okay. But it's hard to get like an affordable house built at that price. You know what I'm saying? It's just really hard. That's the issue is that the price to actually build the houses costs 150 grand. So you have to sell it for 300 grand, you know? Well, one thing we were talking about is doing, um, I think something that could help alleviate the cost is just doing more than one at a time, you know, so that if we do like, if we could get like three lots or something and build three homes and then that kind of reduces the cost and buying materials and stuff like that. So it's all still being investigated by me, but it seems like that would make, that would make sense. Well, there's no, there's like not enough housing in the world right now. So uh, especially in, in, in America, but they're having, cause I just had a, I just did an interview with somebody in Canada and she said the same thing that they're having an issue, but, um, but yeah, I think if anybody can figure out how, and that's why I think that's why tiny houses are getting to be so popular. It's like, are all these people that can't afford houses going to be living in like tiny houses now, you know? <laughs> I love the tiny house. I don't know if I could live in one though. We live in a, we live in a 600 square foot house. Really? Mm-hmm. It's not really tiny, but it's like very small. It's me and my husband and my daughter and it's small. It's small. And we've done it for three years now. And uh, I'm thinking like, I'm thinking I'm ready to move up to at least a bigger size. You know, we <laughs> downsized from like a 2,400 square foot house to a 600 square foot house. It took us six months to sell everything that we had to give a little fit into that. Luckily we own storage facilities. So we just had, you know, put a whole bunch in storage, but uh, we've been going through it and selling everything. And um, we we lived in this, this house for three, almost three years now, but we travel like six months out of the year. Oh, that's nice. You know? So like, we'll do like every couple of months, we go out for a month and go travel or something. So for us, it's like, it's kind of like you're living there, but you also get a little break from it. Yeah. So it's not so bad, but it's hard to live in a small house. I, I get that. Yeah. So I, I feel know. like my kids would drive me nuts in a space that small. I love them, but oh boy. The well, you have five kids. Yeah. <laughs> How old are your kids? Um, well, two of them are at home still. The other three are adult children. So okay. my oldest is 28, um, daughter. And then I have twin daughters that are 22. They're both in college. Um, and then I have a 12 year old daughter about to be 13 next month. And then a nine year old son. That's fun. That sounds awesome. It I bet is. you like holidays are just amazing with y'all. It, they are. And I really, I, I love that. I love having a big family and having adult children and young children. You know, sometimes it's, I feel like I'll never be done raising kids, <laughs> you know, because they're so far apart in age, but oh, yeah. no, I've really enjoyed it. I enjoy the age difference. I feel like I've got to enjoy all of them 
one-on-one, you know, like I had my oldest daughter and she had seven good years of just me and her. And then the twins came and they had their time. And then Sophie came, she had her time. And now my son, you know, he's because he's the only boy and he's just, you know, (laughs) he's my little heart. So that's awesome. I love that so much. Cool. Well, do you have any other final thoughts or anything else you'd like to say to everybody? How can everybody find you, get in touch with you? I know you do some coaching and stuff. Why don't you just let everybody know about that too? Yeah, sure. So um, I have a website I just completed, built myself. I was pretty proud of it. Um, It's Mm themelissajohnson.com. So on there, um, there's just information about me, a lot of uh, resources, all the podcast interviews and things that I've been on. Um, I am working on a course right now. So that should be up soon. I do have a free course, just a five-day business challenge, a five-day build your business challenge. It's free. Um, that's available there. And I also uh, launched a podcast last year. And so the link to that is there also. And then on the first page at the bottom is all the social links. So I do a lot of free content on my social. So um, on Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, especially YouTube, I have a lot of videos and stuff just there about real estate, investing, wholesaling, rehabbing, building your business, leadership, culture, personal development, all those things that I love to talk about all What's there. What's the name of your podcast? It's the E3 podcast. E3, awesome. Okay. And that's based on my coaching philosophy. I have three pillars. It's encouragement, education, and empowerment. I love it. Thank I you. It. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Another badass women investor uh, uh, here. So thank you so much for your wisdom. And everybody, if you're interested in taking uh, taking a, a, a look at her website, it's themelissajohnson.com. All right. And for us, thank you again for hanging out with us. And we will see you guys at the next uh, training session. Thank you.